The other day, uh, of course, I had to go to a bar, and I asked somebody, uh, and forgive my ignorance, I had no idea what Australia Day was, and he said, uh, well, it's kind of like your 4th of July, and uh, he was telling me some more about it, and I said, well, I'm not sure it's quite like my 4th of July. I think you're celebrating a British invasion, and we were celebrating uh, kicking the British out, but nevertheless. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's been great here in Australia, and um, I was talking to my wife yesterday, and she, uh, I, she asked how it was, and I said, well, it's, it's good, except I haven't seen any kangaroos yet. And uh, on my way to drive down here, I got to see one on the side of the road, so that was great. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, let me get started. Oh, I'm sorry, this was my rejected talk. Uh, move on. <coughs> All right. So, uh, uh, so my talk is about uh, defending Apache Hadoop um, using some trusted computing concepts. And I'm going to talk about the uh, technology involved, um, a kind of an anatomy of a targeted threat, um, and some possible ways that you, know, you can countermeasure threats using trusted computing. Um, not as interesting as my rejected talk but, uh, about the Death Star, but nevertheless. Um, I'm, uh, uh, I work for uh, HP. Um, I'm here from uh, uh, from Maryland, uh, Baltimore area near DC, and um, that's it. Moving. So uh, as I said I'm a consultant with uh, U.S. public sector consulting, um, mainly for the Department of Defense, and I'm also a doc doctoral student <coughs> at Towson University. And this is my personal research project. It's not um, not affiliated with HP, but uh, it's part of part of that uh, program. So um, anyway, as I said, I'm going to go through uh, some concepts, and um, I'm going to uh, give a uh, motivation for using trust computing and uh, some details of a Hadoop uh, infrastructure that uses trusted computing, some possible software integrations into the Hadoop code, and uh, some preliminary results and some challenges. <coughs> So when I was putting this together, I, uh, I realized that it probably was a little bit of a niche topic, uh, Hadoop and trusted computing. Uh, so uh, my hope is that you know, with this, uh, you might get other ideas of how you could possibly use this technology and other applications that, you're, um, that you might deal with. Uh, but uh, if you don't know uh, too much about Hadoop, I'm not an expert, but I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, it's an open source software framework, and it's for dealing with uh, big data. Um, one of the buzzwords uh, that we hear a lot today. Um, it's a distributed computation framework, um, and it, uh, pro it provides basically two, um, two frameworks, a storage framework called uh, HDFS and a MapReduce framework, which is the application um, processing framework. And uh, it works by distrib uh, distributing data across a network of commodity servers, and it, allows, um, it basically allows for the storage and processing in a real efficient way. And uh, for certain application domains, uh, it provides a lot of advantages because uh, it takes the processing to the data as, as opposed to bringing the data to the processing. So um, it gives some advantages over traditional um, setups. <coughs> and it's essentially an op uh, open implementation of Google's file systems and um, MapReduce engine. Uh, it was described by Google in their papers uh, that they presented in 2003. Um, I already mentioned it has the two components. Um, and there's also a number of other open source projects that, uh, that make use of the, uh, the, the, uh, the core uh, components. Um, uh, HBase is a big one. It, it, it provides a kind of a relational uh, database view over top of data that you would store in HDFS. There's a number of other um, uh, projects that go along with it, too. And uh, it's primarily uh, written in Java. Uh, there's um, uh, interfaces uh, that you can uh, program MapReduce reduce. Um, Python or other languages, but, but the primary software is, is all Java. And there's some commercial vendors that have picked it up. Uh, Cloudera is a big one. Um, and uh, they've tried to make, take this open source software, package it up, and make it a little bit easier to use. <coughs> so the focus of this is uh, I'm going to be talking about HDFS in particular, um, because that's where the data is stored. And uh, 
So a little bit of the technical details of how it works. Uh, you have a master-slave architecture um, where uh, essentially there's, uh, there's one, uh, or in later versions, more than one name node uh, that um, essentially stores a, um, uh, a database of where individual chunks of data are stored within all your various data nodes. And <clears throat> when a client makes a request, it talks to a name node and um, it uh, directs it to a, a data node to actually pick up the, uh, the particular uh, pieces of the files. So what it does is it, it, it um, essentially creates a, a virtual the actual you know, files are still stored within um, typically Linux file system. Um, and then it creates this kind of virtual mapping on top of it. Um, <clears throat> and the, so the name node, it, it maintains this FS image as the name of it. And it, um, the data nodes um, provide, keep copies of, of the blocks and um, they keep a, a checksum of uh, each, uh, each block to uh, maintain uh, integrity. And uh, they coordinate a uh, replication um, uh, configurable uh, rack aware replication um, so that you can create redundant copies of your data. <clears throat> okay, trusted computing. Uh, uh, so I'm going to go over this a little bit in case there's people that haven't heard of it. I know me personally in uh, uh, working in the industry for, I don't know, about 11 years now, I hadn't really heard of it until a couple years ago I, I went to a, a conference that the uh, NSA put on. Uh, about yeah, some pretty cool stuff here, and, and why haven't I heard of it? And there's a lot of reasons behind that, um, it turns out. Um, and there's been some historic kind of concerns about privacy, um, Microsoft's involvement, of course, um, and the NSA's involvement. So there's been a lot of roadblocks, I'd say, to mainstream adoption. Um, but, you know, and I, I'm not really suggesting uh, kind of using this necessarily on, a, uh, on your desktop. But when you're talking about a specific application domain, like you know Hadoop, for instance, you know there's ways that you can use this stuff to to um, to enhance the security of, of that um, of a particular uh, application domain. <clears throat> so uh, the Trust Computing Group is a consortium. Uh, HP, uh, LIBM, a couple of other big players are involved in, and they um, they uh, basically are a standards body that that is um, you know uh, developing the specs for this technology that other companies go and implement. <clears throat> and the, kind of the core of it is the TPM, uh, it's Trusted Platform Module. Uh, it's, it's present in pretty much any uh, server, laptop, or desktop you can buy, at least, um, at least in the US. And um, <coughs> uh, it uh, stores hashes um, and built-in registers that are called PCRs. They're, um, they stand for Platform Control Registers. Um, and they represent the state of the system at boot. And they reset any time the machine's boot as rebooted. Um, the, the spec calls for 24 of these registers, and they, uh, the, the spec also defines uh, what some of them are supposed to do. There's a lot that aren't. The idea of it is that you can attest the state of the system by, um, by taking these values and presenting them to a remote verifier, and um, they can de basically determine if your system is in a state that they would trust. <clears throat> and it has another number of other features, uh, um, uh, monotonic counters, and uh, NVRAM to store uh, cryptographic keys in. And um, it's not a cryptographic accelerator at all. Um, it's quite slow, actually. It hangs off of, a, I believe, a low pin count bus that the keyboard's attached to. Um, and uh, it's uh, about 100 milliseconds average response time. So it really limits what you can uh, kind of do with it in a time-sensitive application. <clears throat> so it, it can store and protect uh, cryptographic material um, via binding, sealing, or, just, or storage. And uh, binding is uh, encrypting to a key that is tied to the TPM storage root key. It's a key that comes um, uh, basically burned into the TPM uh, from the factory. Uh, and uh, data sealing is basically uh, you, you, you um, won't decrypt something unless your system is in a, a known state. And the known state is the values of the PCRs are in an expected condition. And um, it can conduct uh, key operations inside the chip itself. So uh, basically a rootkit or some system level uh, attack can't compromise it. <coughs> and there's uh, firmware-based TPMs that are appearing. And there's a TP uh, new TPM spec that's upcoming. And I threw this in here just to uh, kind of show what they had in mind uh, when they, they, uh, they put this spec together. And it's, they, um, it, 
basically, you can see that there's a local applications that can access it through kind of a, a layered approach. They have a, a TPM driver and a core services and a trusted software layer. And uh, interestingly, on the scenario three, you can also um, optionally connect to a TPM remotely, uh, which is probably scary in some cases, but um, uh, you know, for a controlled environment, it might be something that, that, is, that is useful. <coughs> And also, fruit is in here has nothing to do with my talk, but this is kind of like the uh, golden grail of what they're, one thing they're trying to do is uh, trusted network connect. Um, basically, uh, you, um, similar to other network con access control technologies, um, except uh, their idea is that they're, they want to tie in databases from cross enterprise um, through this, they call it IF map interface. And um, uh, the idea is that uh, you can do geo fencing and other things like that. Um, and everything basically comes down to uh, to systems that have TPM, so they, they are, um, the trust level is something that can be verified. And here's some of the open source components that are involved um, that are out there that you can use in Linux um, that uh, can enable uh, connectivity to your TPM, and so you can kind of play with it yourself. Um, trousers, um, I believe IPM was developed that it's. Uh, uh, it's open source out there. It's a it's a software stack. It, it comes in a lot of Linux distros by default, or you can easily install it. Uh, TPM tools <coughs> allow for some basic things that you can do uh, with TPM: take ownership, generate the keys, um, access the PCRs, and um, it provides an API that you can use as well. Uh, and then there's um, there's things that you can actually use to uh, help secure your system. And Trusted Grub is one of them. Uh, there's actually a couple of versions of it out there. Uh, but the idea here is it's a bootloader, and um, it takes advantage of the TPM by uh, filling in the PCRs with values that you can define. And basically, the idea is you want everything that uh, is relevant to the security of the system and what you would call a trusted computing base. And that would be um, your kernel, uh, maybe an NITRD, um, certain configuration files that are uh, relevant. Um, and uh, besides Trusted Grub, there's also T-Boot um, that uses DTRM, which is, um, so I should have said, uh, Trusted Grub uses a, an idea of static root of trust, so everything is measured and it's passed to kind of a next layer, which measures and extends these PCRs and into a next application layer, ultimately. Uh, it came to, um, to implement uh, T-Boot uh, uses a DTRM, which um, makes use of uh, Intel um, technology called TXT, Trust Execution technology, I think it stands for. Um, so that's another option that you can use. <coughs> um, and then at the system level, um, uh, IMA is the integrity management, um, uh, and uh, EVM uh, is the uh, extended verification uh, module. You can use, um, they, I think, mainstreamed in the one of the three 3.0 3 kernels. I'm not, not sure which one off the top of my head, but uh, basically, um, the goals here were to uh, to create like a uh, independent kind of offline integrity management system that uh, by using the EVM you can um, you can uh, use the TPM to protect uh, me integrity management. Yeah, excuse me, integrity. Uh, 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 yeah, lost my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry. Um, basically, integrity values of um, of individual files and it's configurable. And also, uh, after everything's handed off, you know, from, T, uh, from Trusted Grub or T-Boot, IMA can take over to, man to uh, extend a PCR with everything that's open by root. And, um, and that would be essentially the Trusted Computing Base. Um, and that's important because <clears throat> typically if you have a server, um, you're not, you know, and it's up and running, the, that value should be pretty consistent because you shouldn't be logging in as root and doing things. So that's one way that when a system's up and running, you can verify that these items that you expected to, to, um, to remain consistent are still consistent. Um, and they're complement to mandatory access control like the SE Linux and SMAC. Um, and uh, it basically, as I said, it, it does a couple core things. It collects, um, it stores uh, as an extended attribute, um, it, tests, it can attest um, to it by uh, signing that IMA PCR, um, and it can uh, do a local appraisal against the database of good values. Um, and it, uh, as I said, with EVM, it can uh, protect these hashes by encrypting them against uh, a key in a TPM. <coughs> All right. 
And then um, uh, lastly, open, open platform trust services. Uh, TCG, um, TCG uh, put out a set of standards called um, platform trust services. And uh, the idea was to, um, so they, they tried to, uh, to implement a uh, attestation uh, based on um, uh, like a, a public key kind of, uh, kind of situation where you would have to essentially trust a third party. And OpenPST was kind of a way to, to, not, uh, to not have that extra overhead. And um, it's, uh, the OpenPST is, a, is a kind of a beta thing that you can try out and it, and it essentially is a collector that you would run on, um, on the client and a uh, server that um, has a verifier uh, that you would have a list of uh, hashes and uh, PCR values that you would expect and, um, and this uh, can verify that. Um, JTSS is a pure Java implementation of the trusted software stack um, and it provides a way to access TPM um, through Java itself and you can um, use it directly or you can use it with trousers and um, you can also enable that, uh, that remote connectivity that I mentioned earlier with a SOAP based interface that it provides. So <clears throat> to get to motivation, I threw this, this kind of picture in here and you kind of have this assumption that if, you know, when you're implementing a cloud that your internal environment is trusted and maybe your external environment is not so much. And, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the key is how, how do you prove that? And this technology um, is a way that you can, you can actually um, prove that. Now there's some, there's some serious kind of uh, issues with, with implementing it, uh, particularly in like cloud scenario where you have hypervisors involved. And um, because there's this lack of a virtualized TPM. Um, but Intel, for instance, has been uh, brought something out they call trusted compute pools. And uh, essentially does a measured boot of the, of the hypervisor and it kind of at least gives you um, kind of the, the idea that that layer of your stack is intact. But going up from that, um, that still is, a, is an issue. <clears throat> uh, so again, motivation. So strength of the dupe is this, um, to uh, distribute processing across hardware and you know, distribute it geographically, outsource possibly. And you know, in certain um, environments, you might have uh, sensitive data that, um, that you know, the, the, measure, the integrity that's built into the Hadoop um, it might not uh, be sufficient. So, <clears throat> and the security was a, was a bolted on kind of effort. Uh, in 2009, uh, Yahoo, um, group from Yahoo um, implemented, uh, wrote a paper on implementing Kerberos as uh, the kind of uh, take, you know, take care of some of the wo woes that they had with security. Uh, but even with that, there's still, there's still serious concerns and um, the, uh, the, the Kerberos, um, and it, it still is expected to be, you know, very isolated from your users and from your um, network in general. Um, and, you know, part of the reason that they decided to do this, um, part this security instead of maybe, you know, a, taking a different route using PKI or something, is they really wanted to maintain the, uh, the, the performance of uh, Hadoop, and um, they said they didn't want any more than a 3% decrease in performance. Um, and here's some assumptions that, that the uh, Cloudera security guide you know, says to make for uh, CDH3 is one version behind of the current one. But you can see, um, you know, this is pretty typical stuff for a security conscious organization, but um, there might, it might not be practical assumptions under certain conditions. <coughs> um, so it makes a lot of efforts to, to ensure that the data is safe for corruption and stored in a redundant fashion. Um, you know, but it can only be trusted to the extent that the people have access to it. Um, and that's, you know, people officially or, or outside, uh, people are able to get into it. And <clears throat> basically, a Hadoop node compromised uh, by a malicious outsider or insider could alter the data outside of any checks within the software. And um, so because of the fact that the files are stored physically on these, these systems. And, um, <clears throat> And there's a lot of other attack scenarios, including replacing the Hadoop software itself with, with packages that do something malicious, like you know export the data out to a, to a, to some server on the internet, or you know corrupt it in some other way. <clears throat> and these might not be typical uh, scenarios for, for you know an organization that is just using it for, you know, simple analytics or something. But if if there's um, if you have data there that's important 
then likelihood is that somebody else might find it important too. And, and I'm talking specifically, you know, in defense applications, healthcare applications. Um, you know, uh, you could have a treasure trove of information that somebody could, um, could be interested in. And, you know, you're not going to have passwords or trade secrets or nuclear launch codes, but there might be, there might be other information there that, uh, that, that somebody could be interested in. <clears throat> so um, I went through kind of a FRET model. I'm going to kind of breeze through it. It's, um, um, so there's ways that you can do data spoofing and, and Kerberos, uh, excuse me, and Hadoop. And one of the, uh, the issues with the Kerberos bolt on is it's actually really kind of hard to configure. It's no, it, it doesn't uh, use it out of the box. Um, even the, uh, like the Cloud Era distribution, uh, you have to do a lot of manual configuration. So basically, um, it, it begs to be left in an unsecure configuration. Um, and uh, so that would leave it open to certain spoofing attacks. Um, even using Kerberos, um, uh, somebody able to access the tokens that it uses can do a patch to hash style attacks. Um, yeah. uh, data stored in HDFS in the clear, um, it's not, not, there's no option for encryption. Um, in most versions of it, it's actually transmitted on the network in the clear as well. The most kind of recent version, they've added a, uh, um, a authentication that based on uh, Kerberos that also adds an encryption layer, um, but that's pretty much just brand new. And um, it had non-repudiation again. There's there's issues with that if you uh, um, if you're not using Kerberos or if you or even if you are. <coughs> and uh, so there's information and disclosures issues um, and uh, denial of service. Uh, interestingly, there's a couple of um, of uh, issue reports out there about denial of service uh, attacks with current versions of Hadoop. Um, and again, it based on the assumption that someone can't access a name node directly except for authorized administrator. And um, there's elevation of privilege issues as well. <coughs> and, uh, and then, of course, uh, possible vulnerabilities in the HDFS code. Uh, just kind of out of curiosity, um, I kind of looked into this a little bit, and there's uh, um, there's some issue reports out there, which is kind of good to see that there's there's people in the community that are um, that are trying to improve the uh, security of it. As far as um, um, recognizing that there's issues with with um, how the name nodes work, how the edit logs work, and uh, even implementing a fuzz checker to um, kind of do automated security testing. So that's good to see. <coughs> Um, I ran a scan on, on uh, the latest Hadoop distribution using a static code analysis tool called Fortify that HP uh, owns, and uh, it, uh, it found a number of vulnerabilities. Now, to, to qualify this, I'll say that, uh, that Fortify and any static code product will hit a lot of false positives, but um, you, know, you can see that with uh, almost 200,000 lines of code, there's, there's certainly possibilities of, of issues there. And, um, and the reason I bring this up is that you know, you can have a number of protections within your, your infrastructure, and if you have a vulnerability in, in your code, uh, that's a lot more difficult to protect. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, advanced persistent threat. Um, this is a kind of another buzz term that, that's come up uh, lately. Uh, so they typically target individual organizations for very convincing ploys. Um, usually they, uh, they go for like a spear phishing attack. Um, and uh, they, you know, they're using zero-day uh, software uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, we've seen this kind of a lot lately. Um, the uh, Stuxnet um, uh, thing, the RSA breach from a few years ago. Um, so there, there's basically, you know, these nation-state hackers that are out there. If you're in the U.S., that's China. If you're in China, it's probably the U.S. And <coughs> um, and there's also, you know, these groups like Anonymous and, and whatnot that uh, seem to be able to intrude into uh, with impunity. So um, there, there's basically the traditional security mechanisms that are, we have out there, firewalls, IDSs, uh, are really not working against these kind of threats because these are real targeted, really very directed and very, uh, they take their time. <clears throat> and this is what we're seeing a lot of. <clears throat> and uh, they use a seven-step uh, exploitation cycle. Uh, they do uh, heavy reconnaissance. They try to make an initial intrusion. They establish a backdoor. Uh, they then they start trying to move laterally by um, taking uh, and finding credentials. Uh, install utilities to help them. Um, get privilege escalate, yeah, escalation, and then they go for the data exfiltration. 
and figure out ways that they can stay on your network. Um, so they'll figure out ways to set up backdoors um, and some obvious backdoors that you know uh, you might say, okay, whatever well, it is, uh, I'll fix that. And meanwhile, they have some some other place that they're exfiltrating data. Um, and uh, I'll quote. <coughs> um, uh, O'Malley is one of the, the chief contributors of the Duke design, and he said, you know, the motivation for adding security was not really to defend against hackers, because they're behind corporate firewalls and only allow employee access. And you know, without disrespecting the the, the um, basically these type of threats, um, you know, uh, you can't really depend on that. So I think that uh, it really begs for uh, an uh, evaluation of um, of ways to, you know. Not just HDFS, but that in, in general, if it's important to, to figure out other ways uh, besides network based um, and standard type of intrusion detection. <clears throat> and uh, the reason that they can invade you know, some of these things, uh, you know, zero days are not detected by antivirus. Um, and your firewalls, you, know, you have to allow ports in and out so users can do their business. And uh, you know, they have ways of masking their traffic on top of these ports that are allowed. Um, to, uh, to be able to, to uh, exfiltrate their data without, without making any sort of obvious um, things known, um, steps known. So here's a, uh, an example of, a, of a, a fairly, what I would call a secure implementation of uh, Hadoop in a corporate environment. And basically the idea here is I've isolated um, my, my core HDFS and uh, uh, MapReduce stuff into a, uh, um, behind firewalls, behind a proxy server. Um, I'm using an HDFS proxy to keep the uh, users from being able to access the data directly. But, you know, there's, there's usually, you know, other channels into the environment. And, you know, the Hadoop admin shown there, he might just SSH into them or go through a firewall directly. So, um, you know, in our APT scenario, uh, he's going to be a target for somebody that wants to get access to that data. <coughs> um, so. A a APT would um, look for some ways, some easy ways to get in. They're going to scan your web portal. Um, they're going to use a vulnerability scanner. Um, now, a good setup is going to probably block most of this. Um, they're going to uh, try for unvalidated web input. Um, and then, if they were able to get in this way, is they're going to start trying to move laterally through my proxy server and um, possibly just set up shop there and, and wait for data to pass by and you know, collect it that way. If they're unable to, to, to access data that way, if they're going to uh, move on to a social engineering style attack, <clears throat> and uh, they'll go for somebody that uh, has access uh, through spear phishing. Um, you know, I, I kind of like the scenario as a, uh, you know, they have the, the resources that, you know, if they know one of the administrators are, are going to a conference, they might present them with a free USB stick that happens to have some zero day software exploit on it. and. Uh, you know, before you know it, they've created a backdoor into their corporate network, and it's happened. So, there, there. As I said, there's, there's um, very uh, kind of hard to detect. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, let's skip that. So. <clears throat> All right, so I was curious if I could take some of the off-the-shelf trusted computing stuff, a, a technology that I spoke about, and integrate it into my Hadoop IT infrastructure and, and, and see if I can maybe have some semblance of, of defenses against like, some of these more advanced you know, threats. And uh, so basically, uh, this, this involved um, taking and uh, implementing a simple cluster with uh, trusted grub. Um, uh, Linux, uh, IMA, EVM, and uh, OpenPST. And we also use DMCrypt, um, and I'll explain how I use that later in IPsec. Uh, <coughs> so to uh, provide a trusted and measured boot um, based on the SRTM, we use Trusted Grub. And the idea is, is um, you know, to make sure that, that uh, you have known uh, software values as you're, uh, as you're booting the system. Now, Trusted Grub itself doesn't actually, um, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't care what those values are. It's just going to put them into a PCR and move on. So that's where later on uh, you have to, to kind of use those PCRs for something to make to make it make it valuable. <clears throat> um, so I give a little diagram of, of what I'm talking about here, um, and uh, also showed a TNC enabled switch. But that, that that's still uh, kind of kind of out there as far as um, uh, implement you know widespread implementation goes. 
<clears throat> yeah. So some uh, some details of what how Trusted Grub works. It fills in these these PCRs that I've shown here. With um, this is kind of how it works by default. And then you can also provide it with a uh, a checklist that will have um, some additional things you want it to check. So for instance, you could have a check. Um, so if I'm just worried about Hadoop, I would have a check my uh, um, my jar files, my config files, and stuff for that, and extend a PCR with those values that I would check, I would use later. <coughs> um, and then, uh, and the IMA subsystem um, can kind of extend this after after I get past the boot process. Um, so here's kind of how the chain of trust works. Um, goes from uh, uh, one thing I left out here is that uh, a BIOS that is um, any kind of modern BIOS will also extend PCRs with the uh, with the value of the um, of the uh, of the BIOS, um, and then uh, goes to Trusted Grub, the IMA, PST, and then you know then we say, well, what, what do we do now? Um, we how do we use it in HDFS specifically? And um, and there's a couple ways that, that came up with with, with um, using this, and I'll kind of get into it here. <coughs> so. So we were able to take the uh, the PCR values that we ex that we expected, and use it to seal and uh, and uh, bind a partition that was encrypted with DMCrypt, and that partition was basically to st you know. So we know that we can't do software based um, encryption without slowing it down by more than three percent. So uh, you know, my idea is well, at least maybe we can check and make sure that the uh, that the integrity information is correct because if you um, so at least you could detect if, if it had been you know data had been altered when it was offline. So it turns out that it's kind of difficult to do um, because of the way it stores the uh, the checksums with the actual blocks in the same directory. So with a little bit of fiddling, I was able to make this to make this work, and uh, essentially um, we. Uh, <clears throat> we can basically uh, protect these uh, checksums via that loopback directory. And uh, when the system's offline, uh, if we were to modify a, a chunk, um, data chunk, then uh, this would be uh, detected as a corrupt uh, file. <clears throat> and then also, the, uh, I didn't see any reason that we couldn't protect the entire name node partition with uh, software-based encryption, because uh, these are much less um, intensive. Um, as far as uh, you know, you're not actually storing blocked out of there, so we were able to do that. And again, if the name node was offline, uh, you would be able to detect any sort of modification after the next um, the next boot. Well, you wouldn't be able to to modify because it, it would be encrypted. <coughs> and then uh, um, set up IPsec tunnels uh, between the nodes. Not practical if you had a humongous environment, but um, basically uh, we uh, we used a. Uh, uh, the TPM to protect a uh, key that was used for an IPsec tunnel that was only unlocked if our um, if our system was in a known state. <clears throat> and then uh, lastly, uh, I started looking into ways that I could possibly integrate um, a, the TPM right into the software stack itself and the, the software. And <clears throat> this is kind of a uh, simplistic way of doing it, but uh, it was kind of a proof of concept. So on the left, uh, yeah. left hand side, I kind of show how the data flow works. Um, so you, you, you have these data nodes that, um, you know, you have these high level HDFS code. It trickles, it's fairly well segmented down to a lower level code that deals with actually reading and storing files. And the blocks are stored physically on the, on, on the Linux file system with a block and a checksum. On the picture on the right, <coughs> What I've done is taken that low-level code and I've altered it to um, to do a couple of things. And uh, essentially, uh, each time a block is uh, comes in to be um, uh, written, it will um, uh, basically it will generate a random AES key <coughs> uh, using the TPM as a for a random number generator, and then we'll um, we'll encrypt the um, the block with that AES key, and then we'll encrypt the AES key. Using a, uh, uh, a key stored in the TPM, the uh, store we could use the storage root key or some other key, and that f is then saved as a separate file that goes along 
uh, with, with the other um, data. So, <clears throat> and then if that file is requested to be read, uh, that same thing kind of happens in reverse. You decrypt the, the block key and then you decrypt the, uh, the, uh, the block and you pass it back up the chain. So, <clears throat> ideally, you would want um, essentially the end user to be able to say, well, I want to encrypt this file because it's really sensitive and they could select within the client or within the application that they're using to, to uh, turn that encryption on and off. Um, and that way you could choose if you want to deal with the performance overhead or not. <clears throat> and I've kind of already explained all this, so I was just going to skip it. Yeah, so the one issue with, with doing something like this is you, you have a, um, you have to protect, you have an uh, basically an authorization key that you, that you use to do operations on the TPM. Uh, you can configure it so it doesn't require any key at all, um, which is probably not a good idea. Uh, and on typical use cases for using a TPM, there's a user present and they're putting in a, a password to you know, unlock a, a drive partition or, or what have you. Uh, but in this case, you know, we want it automated, so we have to figure out a way to be able to get that password into our application in a secure way. And then, you know, in this APT situ um, uh, scenario, um, we don't want, you know, we, we uh, kind of want to keep that protected, and, th and that's, that's kind of difficult. Um, and I, the idea that, that uh, kind of working around with is being able to pull that key from a server after an attestation process is done. It's like during like the initial system boot, so we know currently it's not, the system's not compromised with a rootkit. It's probably pretty safe to send that key down. And then at that point, it's only going to be stored as a hash that's in memory. And then the... Um, the password, of course, should be also different for each server. So if a if a uh, attacker was able to compromise one node, he might he would not he would have to do the same process on each on each node to be able to actual, actually um, do anything. <clears throat> oh, so lastly, uh, uh, so challenges. There's there's a lot. Uh, I say that the that the TCG stuff, uh, trusted computing technology, uh, next to SE Linux and maybe women is probably the, one of the more difficult to understand subjects in the community. Uh, so, you know, it's just a lot to kind of to get your head around. And it's also, um, it's a lot of extra work for an organization that wants to set it up. Uh, so I don't expect to see, I don't expect to see real wide scale adoption of something like this. Uh, but, you know, if you have a real specific type of environment that you're trying to protect, if it's in defense or healthcare, um, et cetera, you know, it's, it's something to worth, worth looking at. Um, and uh, to, to see how it might be used. And I do expect the, the TCG technology to pick up a little bit. I think that there's, they're starting to get a little momentum. Um, Windows 8, as much as I hate it, they've built in uh, a measured boot along with the, uh, the uh, trusted boot. The trusted boot doesn't use the TCG technology. It uses UF, UEFI secure boot. But nevertheless, uh, if, a, if a TPM is present, it will extend PCRs during the, the boot process. Um, and they also have implemented like a smart card kind of interface to the TCG, um, to, to the TPM. And uh, so I, you know, there's a possibility that this, this might pick up. Um, but I found that the, uh, the open source software um, that, that's available is, is pretty immature. Um, a lot of it hasn't been worked on in some time. And uh, so there's certainly a lot of challenges. Things like if you wanted to use IMA, EBM, yeah, uh, this was Fedora 16. I ended up having to rebuild the kernel from source. And, uh, you know, I can do that, but a typical system administrator might not have that kind of skill um, to do. And, you know, and for pretty much everything, you got to do a lot of tweaking, a lot of, um, you know, intense manipulation of the environment to use. So, um, you know, there, there's some challenges, but uh, I think that it's kind of an interesting um, technology that's out there, it's been out there, and uh, I think it's a, it's a good thing for, for people to, um, to consider. And as I already said this, so I think that's it. Okay, we'll take some questions. If nobody else asks one, I will. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, one of the, the hot topics in distributed computing these days is uh, data deduplication mm -hmm. um, or dereplication. D yeah, okay, dedu deduplication. Right. Um, so how would you see data, de data deduplication in a distributed integrity environment? Well, 
Yeah, that's kind of a hard question. I think that um, <laughs> I think that that it's not necessarily. Hmm, I'm not sure how how tied that that would be, but. Uh, I do know that from what I've seen kind of at HP, um, a lot of organizations are starting to use uh, Hadoop as a dumping ground. And I think that maybe it's because they don't really understand what it's for or what it was supposed to be for. So they're kind of using it as a catch-all for anything they might think they could possibly use at some point. So typically, I'd say that this, is, this should be considered like a data warehousing environment. So you know, I, I think that um, it, it's probably OK to have redundant the data and, and something like this because the, what you're supposed to be using it for is to do analytics on, on not stuff that you're trying to do real time. So um, I don't think it really answers your question, but <laughs> that's all I have. OK, that's fair. Yep. So uh, we have a question back here. So what, what size class do you What size it? What size of Duke cluster have you rolled this out on, and what what are, what's the underlying OS? Sure. Yeah. This is um, this is just a little pet project, so it's only on a simple uh, two-node cluster with another node that's a that's a uh, open PST server. So um, very very simplistic kind of initial. Just see if I could do it kind of kind of thing. Um, I, I would expect if you try to scale it, you're going to certainly have have uh, some issues. And, in a way that, that the static root of trust works, um, and with the, the open PST verifier, is that you have a database of you know these values that you trust. And if you were to go and update any software on those systems, you have to go and update those known values as well. So <clears throat> you start scaling that big time, you know, it becomes becomes kind of uh, something you'd have to plan as part of any sort of upgrade to your to your system, I guess. Um, Next question. Good day. Yeah. What sort of security architecture changes would you encourage the HDFS or Hadoop project in general to adopt? Obviously, you've identified that it's not particularly like it's just banged on the side and with Kerberos. What would you suggest they do to enable everybody to have like a safe HDFS, a safe MapReduce set of servers? Right, that's a good question. You know, and I wouldn't. I'm certainly not criticizing how they they designed the security, but I, I will say that they made assumptions about how your how you would typically use this in your corporate environment, and and even if you work under those assumptions, I guess all I'm trying to say is you're still you still can't be sure that 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 is a safe environment. Even if you implement this, I'm not sure you could be 100 percent safe, but it certainly gives you a whole nother kind of layer of complexity that somebody would have to break through. And um, so, so as far as the actual source itself, I think that, um, I think that they should, um, I think they should evaluate how they're using Kerberos in it. I'm not sure that from what I kind of understand of how the ticketing system works. So it will um, essentially, uh, so when a client comes in to authenticate, uh, it you know, passes request to a Kerberos environment and it says, okay, you're authenticated. And then from there on, uh, the Hadoop software handles the, um, the authentication uh, between the, any sort of data nodes you need to go to via uh, what they call delegation tokens. So uh, in order to do this, they have to um, uh, basically store a whole a bunch of symmetric keys for the time that, 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 the, um, uh, uh, that that ticket's good for, which I think by default is like 24 hours. So it leaves kind of like a big window for for, for those tickets to be compromised and pass a hash kind of thing happening with them. Um, so some of that, I guess, could be done through configuration, but I think maybe a look at how the, the ticketing systems work is some, and, and you know, I know that they wanted to, um, to maintain the performance, and that was paramount, but I think it would be kind of, um, and I think they're kind of going this way. They've built in like the SASL framework for, um, for uh, in-transit encryption in the most late, latest version. and. Uh, Somebody should be able to decide for themselves whether they want to take the hit on the performance and you know, have the extra security. OK, next question. All right, well, thank you. Yeah, thanks. OK, so, so uh, 